Well, I think there's a problem, and I'm going to use the word love because the misconception with the word love is if I allow someone to believe a certain way and I get you to believe that, then that's what your perception of love is. And with that, your reaction will actually produce something that's not real. The actual true definition of love is love is the willingness to give of oneself at its own expense. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave. We can just stop right there. Now, most people think the opposite of love is hate, but it's not. The opposite of love is lust. Lust is the willingness to take from others mm -hmm. at their expense. Yes. Hate is a counterpart of love. The, God said in the, in the Bible that uh, he loved the sinner, but he hates the sin. So those two, as long as you live, they will grow up together, and God will separate that. So just having uh, a person thought process to believe a certain way will control him and allow him to operate uh, in a, a, a way that's not uh, God's will. God is good, man. Praise God. All right, verse 4, 1 Thessalonians 2 says what now? But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Now, God is the one that looks on our hearts, doesn't he? Not just our actions, but our hearts. We speak, not as pleasing men, but God. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man bringeth a snare. We are commanded from Genesis to Revelation to fear God. I love uh, Psalm 2.11. Serve the Lord. How? With fear. And rejoice. How? With trembling. Okay? Verse 5. What's that say? For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Oh, so Paul and the apostles... Paul and those that labored with him didn't use flattering words, huh? He didn't flatter people. Or a cloak of covetousness, which is, in other words, Paul describes it as filthy lucre um, in, in order for, like, to get, um, to get some gain for yourself or, or for, or for uh, from others. Um, verse 6, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Talk about but, that. Verse 6. They didn't seek the glory of men, amen. They did not seek the glory, nor of men sought we glory. Paul only cared about how he looked in the eyes of God, first and foremost, I should say. Uh, isn't, he, that, isn't that a verse in John where it says that Jesus, he says he needed to see the testimony of men because he knew what that was in their heart? That's good, yeah. That's the second chapter of John. Yeah, that's good. John 2, verse John's. 23 and 24, I believe it is. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover on the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and knew not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus knew all men, and he knew what was in man. Remember, later on, one day, they're heralding Jesus, and the next day, some of the same people are calling for him to be killed. See, there's only one that's never going to change. Paul said that all men forsook me, but the Lord stood with me. Amen? Second uh, Timothy 4, 16 through 18, uh, the psalmist, the sweet psalmist of Israel, David, said that even when my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take, take me up. Amen? Psalm 2710. It doesn't matter who forsakes you on this earth, beloved. God is always going to be there for you and with you. He will never leave you or forsake you if you're his child. He loves you. Hallelujah. That's a beautiful truth. Jesus didn't put his trust in men. You know, in 2 Corinthians 516, Paul said that uh, we know no man after the flesh. Not even Jesus, we don't even know after the flesh, he said. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. We're to worship God in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So it doesn't matter where you're at. God is there. Because wherever you're at is in his creation. 
You can't be anywhere but in his creation. He is there. And he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Friend, you can find a refuge, a sanctuary, a place in the spirit with God. Anywhere you are. It's not about geography as the woman at the well found out. But it's about worshiping him in spirit and the truth. A lot of folks think they got to go to Jerusalem and get spiritual. Why wait till then, first of all? Second of all, you're not going to get any more spiritual in Jerusalem than you can get right here. Because it's about being as a state of your spirit. It's not about a geographical location. It's about worshiping God in spirit and truth. Dying to yourself, laying your life down and crying out as John the Baptist did. That God, Father, Jesus, you must increase and I must decrease. Amen. I'd rather stay right where I'm at and know the Lord in the spirit than to go to Jerusalem, go to Italy, go to Hawaii, go to all these beautiful destinations with an empty heart. A heart that's not full of the one whom the Bible says is our exceeding great reward. The Jesus, only riches we have. Jesus, Jesus said, where well, your treasure is, or your heart will be also. Amen. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father on the throne of, the throne of God. And uh, um, if our heart is... Um, as Christ is in us, the hope of glory, and he's in our heart. Um, we have uh, assurance in our heart that um, knowing that we love not in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth, knowing that we are in him, um, have that assurance. Amen. Praise God. Amen. It also states that the, uh, the heart is evil. Deceitful. It is very deceitful. There is nothing good in man. So we have to have uh, a God to come into our lives and live or dwell within us in order to start changing our heart. We're not changed overnight, but the more and more that you study the Word of God, He cleans all the negative things that you used to do mm. and wash, wash your your soul mm. and your body to make it uh, that place where He said He's coming back for a, a church without a spot or wrinkle. When that day comes then the cleansing will be finished. Amen. You know, and uh, we were talking earlier about having, you have a place, you've been born again, you can come boldly before the throne of grace and receive mercy and grace to help you in time of need. And as Anson was alluding to and talking about, Jesus Christ is making intercession for us at the right hand of the Father. I love uh, Ezekiel eleven sixteen. Uh, God said his people were going to be scattered all over the place geographically. And yet he said, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. God will be a sanctuary to us. If we'll draw near to him, he said, I'll draw near to you. James 4, 8. Regardless of the geographical location in the earth, uh, I am your home, he's saying. And also, uh, regardless of who's with you, who's not. You know, most or all of the disciples forsook Jesus when he was hung on the cross. But, uh, and Paul said again, all men forsook me, but the Lord stood with me. Okay, I want to read something from um, Galatians. It says, brother, if a man be overtaken in a fault. Now we can stop right there and just switch those two words around and say, uh, taken over because that means the yeah. Holy Spirit is not in you and whatever sin that you allow or play with actually uh, it, it took over an example would be like someone is playing with drinking alcohol smoking crack or doing smoking cigarettes or, or any of those things but what happens is you play with that stuff you keep playing with and keep playing with and then one day now, those very things that you played with, they have now taken over. The spirit has come in, and when it was sitting in the passenger seat, it's now driving. So, if you want to quit, quit. You can't. The spirit has taken over. You cannot quit on your own. So, it said, brother, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, lest I be tempted himself. Meaning that when you see a brother that's actually going through something like that, you know you got some stuff too. So don't be so hard on him. So you just help him in the spirit of meekness, at least I be tempted himself. Now, the tempted himself is actually uh, referring to if you was an alcoholic 
and you see a brother that's actually struggling with that, you might not be the one to be over there helping them, but you may be tempted to fall again. You don't go and get a job at a daycare center when you was a child molest and he didn't deliver you from it also. Yeah. So just think about those things and always try to help each other in the spirit of meekness. Amen. In Romans 13, 14 says, uh, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh. Don't go among around people or places that are going to cause you to sin. Amen. What's, where are we at? We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're picking up in verse 6. Nor of men, Paul said, sought we glory. Neither of you. We didn't seek for your accolades and your glory. Now, Jesus said in John 7, 18. He that, uh, what did he say? He that uh, speaks of himself. There it is. Seeks his own glory. You see, we ought, we ought to not be speaking about ourselves too much. Especially those called the leadership. Amen. It's not about us. Not about you. It's definitely not about me. I don't have anything outside of Christ. Neither do you. Hmm. Paul didn't either. He knew his own poverty. Paul said, well, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 5. Notice, we preach not ourselves. It's not about us. It's not about our ministry. Not about our local church. We aren't the center of the universe. Jesus is. Last time we checked, <laughs> actually 1 Timothy 6, 15, he's the holy potentate. He is the supreme ruler of the earth. The earth is the Lord's, the one who made it and sustains it. In fact, I, whoever's listening to my voice, I can tell you the air you're now breathing is his. It's not yours. It's his. The mouth you're breathing in it through, he made it, not you. You see, he's God all by himself. No one can stand beside him. He will also share his glory with no one. So Paul said again, for we preach not ourselves. Now he's saying right here, we don't seek your glory, nor the glory of others, because he feared God. When we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. He wasn't burdensome to them. Verse 7, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. This is another mark of a true disciple, as he's making disciples. What's he doing? He cares about the people that God has put in his life. I tell you, I'd rather have one person I could influence that God would bless me to do a good job with, and man, we're, we're getting some pointers on that tonight, aren't we? <laughs> then that to, to be some CEO pastor who doesn't disciple anybody. Why? Because he's too busy, uh, you know, seeking his own glory, uh, having you know his forty, fifty thousand dollars coming in a month, and that ain't that ain't a joke, by the way, uh, or whatever. And uh, what's he going to do when he stands before God? He didn't go out and teach all pe people all the things Jesus taught him. No, he exploited the people and rode the wave of the uh, those who uh, turned their ears from the truth, those who uh, had itching ears. Okay, as the Bible says, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, it's a heart matter, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I would not want to die. You know, we got an email the other day, and some guy was saying that I was uh, we were jealous of somebody that we have exposed on the website because they're a false teacher. <laughs> Man, that was comical. I would not want to be in these people's place. I'd rather be a, a financial pauper for all of my days on this earth, like the poor man in the book of Luke 16 that Jesus talked about, who sat outside the gate of the one who... The rich man who fared sumptuously. Let me tell you, this life is like a vapor of smoke. A vapor that appears for just a little time and then vanishes away. James 4.14 In eternity, we see in Luke 16, 19-31, 19 that the man that was rich on earth immediately became poor. And he's still poor 2,000 years later. He's still consciously suffering brutal, excruciating pain in hell. But the man that was poor on earth and knew the Lord is forever going to be in comfort. He will never experience another tear or negative uh, thing ever in any realm we read in Revelation 21.4. There will be no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, no more sorrow. Now where do we want to be when we draw our last breath? So verse 8, what's that say again? 
So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Wow. Paul is, we see here many things, including the fact that he wasn't exploiting these people for his own purpose. Paul was the real deal. He was a genuine disciple of Jesus, an apostle and servant of Jesus Christ. He wasn't there for his own good. He wasn't in hireling. And therefore, what do we see him doing? He gave his own soul to these people, him and those with him, because they were dear to him. Amen. We Hebrews 13, verse 7 and 17 also bring out some good points about true under shepherds. They're servants first and foremost. They're not elevating themselves. They're preaching the word, only the word, these are earmarks. And they're also watching over the souls of those they've been given a charge over or oversight over in, in, in the in the calling of God. Amen. Okay. You, you think you can call this uh, this gospel that the he was uh, in, imparting to them was uh, the gospel of grace um, as, as uh, uh, Ephesians 4.29 says um, let evil, let not evil corrupting things come out of your mouth but that which of the edification that you may minister grace unto the hearers Amen um, Verse 9 and, uh, okay. in ministering to the saints um, Paul talks about uh, chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians um, talking about the Macedonians he says, for to their power, verse 3, I bear record, day and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. Um, that gift goes almost to the to the to the last verse of chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians um, 15. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Um, verse uh, 4, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. And take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints, ministering grace, giving giving grace. Um, Jesus um, gives like um, basically like the epitome definition of, of grace when he sends the seventy out two by two. He says, "Freely give what you have freely received." Um, Amen. And this they did, verse five. Not as we hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord, and unto us by the will of God. Amen. You know, all of this is rooted in, it was mentioned earlier, in giving our lives to the Lord. He's worthy. And if you count him worthy of it, then you'll go into the ground, like Jesus said, and die. And then God will raise you up in his power. And these things will begin to come to pass. You can't do these things in your flesh. Neither can I. That's why we need the baptism in the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist said of Jesus, he will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and in fire. You know what that means? If you don't, God will show it to you if you seek him in this matter. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 2, we're reading in verse 8 that Paul and those that ministered with him were affectionately desirous. And Paul always speaks of us in 2 Corinthians, and we see him here. We and us, see? Uh, we ought to all be ministering together. We're a team, mm -hmm. if you will, for Jesus. Not just one of us, all of us. We do our parts, and we're here uh for the cause of Christ and for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be spread and for other believers to be taught all the things that Jesus and the apostles taught. Okay, verse 9, what's that say? For ye remember, brethren, our label, labor and travail, for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. I tell you what, the gospel, when you're called to do it, especially full time, it's hard work, man. You notice this word here? Chargeable. Yeah, labor. Or labor, Travail. Travail, yeah, but, Travail. Not, but not be chargeable for it. Yeah. So hey. he did tents too. He built tents. Yeah. And he labored day and night doing the gospel and trying to make money. Yeah. And uh, I, it's my opinion that some of these folks should have been given a little bit more, but, uh, you know, that, that's just totally an opinion. But anyway, Paul didn't want to be, uh, he didn't have the funds, obviously, to make it through. And so he worked because he didn't want to be a burden to them. And uh, that's a blessed thing. But, you know, the gospel is, let, people have no idea that the, the, the infinite need for the gospel among just God's people, much less the lost. There's no end to the people that can be reached and that need to be reached. There's never been a day when we uh, had such a need for people who are called into full-time ministry and are truly following Christ 
to be able to do that. So uh, if we all do our part, that can come to pass. What's it say in verse 10? Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behave ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that you would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Notice, not just Paul and them were to be unblameable. Every Christian is to be unblameable and behave ourselves uh, pleasing to God. Amen? All right, verse 13. For this cause, also thank we God without ceasing, because when we received the word of God, when yes. you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus, for ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. Well, I want to uh, talk about um, the couple of verses that you just read. Um, he just got through talking about uh, life is done by vapor. I remember a kid coming to me and he had just got through talking to an elder in the church about life. And the uh, old guy was telling him about his family and uh, growing up as a kid when he got married and all this other stuff. And the young guy came to me and he asked me what was my uh, opinion of life and the things that I've done. And I asked him if you really want to know the truth, and let me explain to you what life really is. Now, life is just what the guy said, a vapor. So you you spend all this time here on this earth without a relationship with God, you're gonna die and go straight to hell. Yeah. You won't have no end of burning. It's just total destruction. And on top of that. You have to think that uh, all this time that you've been here and you live in vain, nothing. What are you, what are you here for? So uh, I just want to conclude with those verses that uh, let's not waste our time. Let's do something uh, for, the, for the Lord and let him get the glory. And we'll just wait in the end and we get what we're going to get from God. Just because we gave him the glory. Amen. And, and Paul said, I believe it was in Ephesians, uh, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Amen. Redeeming the time. Buying back every moment for the glory of God. Brother Spanish is referring to the verses basically 11 and 12. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you. As a father doth his children. Um as Paul has says in um, Second Corinthians, I believe that he has begotten them through the gospel. Um, yes. He's begotten all these churches through the gospel. He, he, he preaches everywhere in every church. Um, as a father doth his children, that you walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto His kingdom and glory. Wow, you are on earth, as 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 Todd just said, redeem the time for the days are evil. Yes. All right, verse 17, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time, in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even our Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered oh, us. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Who hindered Paul? Satan. Satan. You see, we think some people don't realize that the part, the arch enemy of God has in warring against the saints but it's all the way through scripture we wrestle not against flesh and blood the apostle wrote but against uh principalities and powers the rules of the darkness of this world and against spiritual weakness in high places and that's so much why we need to be put on the whole armor of god and be in christ jesus uh even the uh, angel michael 
uh, didn't uh, say, I rebuke you, Satan, but he said, the Lord rebuked you, as we read in the book of Jude. So we need to be hidden in Christ, because we're no match for the, uh, the enemy of all souls, outside of the power of the one uh, unto whom all power is given, heaven and earth, Jesus Christ. Amen. And then greater is he that is in us, amen, than he that is in the world, First John 4, 4. So Satan hindered the apostle Paul from coming unto them. See, uh, Satan can hinder the work of the Lord. Amen. And then what's it say, say in verse 19 and 20? And we'll wrap this First Thessalonians 2 up. Basically, these next two um, verses are, are not even being present with one another, um, but just rejoicing. Um, for it goes and say in verse 19, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Amen. They were his glory and joy. And he was going to receive <coughs> those that labor to love and nurture and teach the body of Christ the things of the Lord uh, are going to be uh, eternally rewarded for doing such. And many of you listening to me do the work of the Lord. I want to encourage you as we close this segment in Hebrews 6.10. The Bible says, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I know there's people that are doing the work of the Lord. They're given over to God. They're given over to building up the saints and winning the lost. And perhaps somebody that's listening is going through a very difficult time. But uh, we know that the Lord is with you. And he's going to be with you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. And that he is your refuge. And perhaps he's orchestrating and allowing these things, even Satan's hindrances, uh, to bring about a deeper intimacy to cause you to scamper unto his feet and sit at his feet and dwell in the secret place of the Most High with him in a way that perhaps has never, that you've never experienced yet. Amen.